Uh, speaking of school, uh, you guys know I'm always excited. Uh, I feel like I'm extra excited, and I'm like extra saved today. Uh, cause I've been hanging out with a bunch of pastors in our doctoral residency the last two weeks. So I feel like I'm extra saved. So just, we're just going to do this. We're going to see what the Holy Spirit does. Uh, but I, I have the honor, the privilege, and the assignment to really start us uh, we're on a three-week sermon series, and we're going to call this uh, My Piece of the Pie. Yeah, My Piece of the Pie. Uh, what am I supposed to do? I, I think it's the, one of the hardest questions, but one of the most common questions in the life of being a Christian. I mean, short of actually accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the next question that we all wrestle with, whether you're currently wrestling with it, have wrestled with it, or going to wrestle with it, is what is my piece of the pie? Simply put, God, what am I supposed to do? Because if I'm being honest, I read Scripture and I read the Bible, and I see all these amazing men and women that seem to be doing all these amazing things for God, and if I'm being honest, that, that's just not me. I even come to church, and, and maybe I, I'm, I'm very obviously seeing what somebody else's calling is. You can say it's obviously, because when I come there, I see Pastor Todd. I see Pastor Sandy. I see you, Pastor Dez, and I, I see other people on the platform, and you guys are preaching, and, and it seems like you've given everything for that, and I can see your calling, but what is my piece of the pie? What, what does God want me to do? So it's one of those hardest questions. Before we start, uh, if you're wrestling with that question, I want you to know that's good because that means you care. If, if you're wrestling with that question, that means you're good because you're saying, God, you've done so much for me. How can I live that out and introduce somebody else to you? And so we're going to talk about this today just for a little bit. And so uh, I, we're doing this three-week sermon, so that's the big picture and so today we're going to talk about kind of a little cut of the pie, and we're going to talk about something called the power of an invitation. Yeah, the, the power of an invitation. Uh, we're going to do this. If we was in a black church, i say turn to your neighbor. So turn to your neighbor. We're going to try it. I've been wanting to try this for a while, Pastor Todd. So turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, there's power in an invitation. See, there it is. Okay, we learned it. We're good to go. And so we're actually going to be reading from the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, the 14th chapter, beginning at verses 12, and then we're going to read to 14, and it reads like this. He said also to the man who had invited him, this is Jesus talking, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, invite the crippled, invite the lame, and invite the blind. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. I, I love this conversation because before we get into verse 12, let's jump back 12 verses and we're going to start off in Luke 14. And what we see it's Jesus is eating at the house of a prominent Pharisee. Now, now when you read scripture from an everyday Western lens, um, this seems like a very normal conversation. We, we see Jesus, we see him at somebody's house, and he's eating dinner, okay? We, we got that. But, but the significance is the Bible tells us in Luke 14 that Jesus is at the house of a prominent Pharisee on the Sabbath day. And so understand what the Sabbath is. The Sabbath means rest. But if you go into Sabbath, understanding the law of the Sabbath, you oftentimes had it where you did not do anything. I mean, the law, was, the Sabbath was for the good people. And if you're a good person, you obeyed everything on the Sabbath. I mean, it would be things such as this. On the Sabbath, you actually weren't supposed to cook. So oftentimes, if you were a good person, the good people, you would cook the day before, and then you would eat on that day because you didn't want to cook. I mean, the Sabbath was so serious, it said that if you take oftentimes more than a thousand steps, 
that's considered a work. So you have to limit your mobility, how much you're moving around. And so Jesus is at the house of a prominent Pharisee on the Sabbath, and what we see is him actually teaching. We see him challenging, and you see them having conversation and eating. So off the rip, Jesus is at somebody's house doing something he ain't supposed to be doing, talking to people he ain't supposed to be talking to on a bad day. Dang, Jesus. That's just the first verse. <laughs> so you got Jesus, and he's talking to this Pharisee, and he's having a conversation with this Pharisee, and I love it because in the text we see what's getting ready to happen. Because mind you, Jesus has now gained notoriety. I mean, we're in Luke 14. I mean, everybody knows Jesus now. This is the beginning of Luke. We're in Luke 14. So everybody has seen Jesus. They, they've seen Jesus teach. They've seen Jesus heal. They've seen Jesus talk to people he's not supposed to talk to. I love the fact that when you see Jesus, you see him in two contexts. You see Jesus hanging out with the poor. You see Jesus hanging out what we would call the marginalized. You would see Jesus hanging out with people that the world has discarded. But you also see Jesus hanging out with the rich. You also see Jesus hanging out with the elite. You also see Jesus hanging out with the who's tools of his time. And so what you see is Jesus is having conversations in two contexts, and right now he is at the house of a prominent Pharisee telling him and challenging him about life. And so I love this piece because Jesus doesn't condemn this Pharisee. However, he challenges the Pharisee. Now, mind you, I think about four weeks ago, I preached on Nicodemus, and we talked about the word Pharisee, and the word Pharisee defined is the separated ones. And remember I told you that you got to be a bad group to call yourself the separated ones. I mean, like, if you come talk to me, you're like, Pastor Des, can I meet with you? No, no, no. I'm a separated one. You don't talk to me. I mean, this is the conversation that's going on. And so Jesus is talking to this group, this Pharisees. And the Pharisees know they look good. No, they have money. No, they have power. No, they have reach. This is Jesus having this conversation with them. So I love this moment because oftentimes you would think, based on kind of like our human perspective, that Jesus would condemn that. You would think that Jesus would say something completely different, but Jesus doesn't condemn them. He challenges them. And so what he does now in the scripture is that you see this different approach because if we're being honest, a lot of us in this room, including myself, we've had moments where We've been the separated ones, where we have our little Christian community. I'm talking about me, not you. I'm talking about me. We have our Christian community. We have our same work group friends. We all look alike. We all think alike. We all have similar financial backgrounds. And that's easy, the separated ones. And so I'll be honest with you, uh, I didn't start off that way. If I'm being very honest and vulnerable, Pastor Todd. Uh, so let me give you a little bit about, uh, most of you know that I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, I'm going to tell you the dynamics of my city. I was actually raised in a very, um, I would say, racially divided city to this day. And so I grew up on the north side of Omaha, and it's literally probably 95% black. And so on the north side of Omaha, uh, you didn't have a lot of financial gain, a lot of financial privilege. And so for me, we grew up not having a lot of money, but always loving Jesus. And so that was normal for me in my context. In my context, not a lot of people made money. We were okay. We were communal. We loved each other. But we, we didn't have money. And so when I moved to California in 2016, uh, I brought my wife and my two sons with me. And, and I remember that California, I, I thought I had made it because I'm in California. And so I get here, and, and I had this apartment. Now, mind you. This apartment was nice. I had visited before, and the apartment was in Citrus Heights. And so uh, I didn't know that the front of the apartment that I toured didn't look anything like the back where I was going to live. <laughs> so they didn't tell me that, Raymond. I didn't know. I didn't know anything about California. And so, so the front was beautiful. So the front was gorgeous. I mean, it had grass, and it was all green. Uh, I had, you know, like a beautiful basketball court. And so I said, ooh, my wife's going to love this because we made it. This is it. We made it. God, you've been good. So I bring my wife and my kids, 
And then I go through the front of the apartment, but then they say, no, you're in the back. Well, the back of the apartment looked at a 7-Eleven gas station dumpster. <laughs> so, so, so my balcony and my window, I always heard homeless people fighting, and the police were always called. And so for that season, I said, oh, God, I messed up. I'm a young husband. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm trying to pastor, and I feel like I've failed you, God. So I am praying, God, will you deliver me, give me a little bit of money so I can buy my family a house? These are my prayers. Because mind you, my, my demographic's different. I, I don't come from money. I don't come from a lot. So I know Jesus, but I didn't know money and finances. Well, well then God blessed me. And so we're, we're now 2023, going to go home and plant a church. And my prayers look different. And God had to check me. Because my prayer was, oh, God, I need you. Can you provide? And now my prayer here, Pastor, I had a moment where I said, God, I'm sorry for, for complaining. Because I said, oh, God, woe is me. Woe is me that I have two houses I got to sell, one and buy another one in Nebraska. Woe is me with all the stresses of life. And in that moment, you start to see how different and how separated you can be from what you know. Because at the moment in 2016, I didn't know anything. But now that God had grown me and blessed me, and I had a little bit of financial resource and ability, and I'm in a different place in my life, all of a sudden, I find myself in circles with people that look more like me and act more like me and think like me. And so now I'm like, okay, God, what do I do in this moment? And Jesus is having this conversation with the Pharisee. He said, it's okay. It's okay to have some money. It's okay to be financially stable. I, I got you all that. However... I don't want to change what you have right now. I just want to readjust it. So he says, I want you to invite people to your party. Now, when you invite people to your party, I want you to invite the four people we talked about. Because historically, these parties was party. I mean, it was almost like P. Diddy and his all-white party, okay? Only the elite get in these parties, okay? Like in the biblical times, this is who we're talking about. I mean, this is an elite party. You had people who were politicians. You had people who were presidents. You had people who sit in cabinets. I mean, these are, this is the Pharisees. These are the who's who's of the time. And this person is good at gathering. This person is good at inviting people. And so he says, Jesus says, I want you to do all that. Except I don't want you to invite your rich relatives. I don't want you to invite your cousins. I don't want you to invite the president and the senators. I don't want you to invite them. I want you to invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And now when we write this, when we read this in Scripture, uh, the, the question is, because theologians will take either two approaches. You usually have it where, was Jesus talking about the physical? Or is Jesus talking about the spiritual? Is Jesus talking about the physically blind? Or is Jesus talking about the spiritually blind? I would argue that it's a both conversation. And so I love this because there are folk that's saying, Jesus, who do I invite to my next party? He said, all the elites you would usually invite, I don't want you to do that. He said, instead, I want you to invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. And the reason why I want you to do that is going to cost you. It's going to cost you. Now, growing up, we used to wear the WWJD. What would Jesus do? Like, if you didn't have a WWJD, I don't even know if you love Jesus, okay? <laughs> That's how big it was. If you didn't wear a WWJD bracelet, I don't care if you was black, white, purple, or pink, okay? No matter what race you were, everybody that kind of loved Jesus had on a WWJD bracelet. And you ask the question, what would Jesus do? And it's easy to wear those when you're around everybody that looks like you. But it's hard to wear those when people are different. It's hard to wear those when people come from different backgrounds. Because what happens is, if you ask the question, what would Jesus do? It's saying Jesus is going to remove you from your comfort zone to help somebody else. And that's the hardest part of Christianity. Oh, it's good when I got my Christian circle. And you need that. Oh, it's good when I'm hanging out with my family. Oh, you need that too. It's great to have relationship with everybody that looks like me and acts like me. Keep that. Jesus says, all that's great, but also I want you to challenge yourself a little bit, and I want you to go hang out with other people. And so you have this conversation because we're introduced to the hard side of Jesus. 
where Jesus encourages us to push past our comfort zones and invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the paralyzed. And my question now is, who is that for you, though? I got to ask this question because Jesus is having this conversation, and what he does is, because there's a Pharisee, he's giving him the extremes. And so he's telling him, you're a Pharisee. You're not talking to these people. You're up here, and your eyes, they're down there. Who are you talking to? And so what we have to do now is, it's a, it's a big $5 word. Raymond, you probably get this in seminary because we're at the same seminary. I just graduated a little before you. Uh, it's called a hermeneutical bridge. So you draw a hermeneutical bridge from the Bible to today. And so that's the very fancy word was, what does that mean today? That's all it means. And so in this hermeneutical bridge we're going to draw is, if, if we were writing this today, I think it would look something like this. I want you to invite four kind of people. I want you to invite somebody to your party from a different race. I want you to invite somebody from your party to your party from a different age demographic. So the first one, different race, that's what we call multicultural, multi-ethnic. It's the fancy word we use today. Uh, Difference of age demographic. That's what we call intergenerational. See, we talk about all the time, we just have great words for it. Uh, A different political view. Now that's like saying, I'm more conservative, maybe I should invite a liberal. Well, you're more liberal. I like moderates best. I'm more moderate. I should kind of have more friends in these circles. And then the last one is a different socioeconomic status, meaning how you see the world is different. Financially, it's different. And so what I love is this relevance you see because Jesus is hanging out with this Pharisee on the Sabbath, and what you start to see is Jesus tells the host to do one thing, he tells them, you need to get everybody saved that's around you. Oh, no, he didn't say that in the Bible. He said, no, no, I got it. You need to make sure that everyone around you has a car to drive. So buy everybody a car. Oh, he didn't say that either. Okay. Uh, well, what did he tell them? He, t- he said, I just want you, one thing, can you invite them? He just, that's all he says. I want you to invite them. And now I love this conversation Because what we see is the power of an invitation. Because this is the thing. He's saying, if our worlds ever come together, do you know how much better we'd be? Okay, I'm going to give you a practical because, um, for example, you can have two people from two different worlds. Okay? So let's just, let's look over here. We have this person uh, who grew up poor, who grew up not having anything. And they found God because they said, God is the only thing I ever needed, the only thing I ever had. Because I didn't have any options, but I have to find God because it's all I have. And then you have somebody over here that was raised with a little more financial stability. But they were raised in church, and they say, I love God, and I know God, but there's still some things going on. Now, on this side, and this is where we have divide in the church and actually divide of today, because on this side, we're saying, oh, if you've never been poor and you've never been suffering, you have no right to say anything because you don't know. But then on this side, we're saying, oh, no, 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 no. I have money, and if only you could be like me because we're the best and you guys don't know. We're the best thing that's happened around here. If you guys get on board, I would argue that both are right. And it's not that their worldview is incorrect. It's just that their worldview is incomplete. Because my incorrect worldview says, over here, I'm better than you because I've had to suffer. Over here, you can say, I actually better than you because we have what you're trying to get. And if they only had conversations and they only talked about it, because you'll see over here, this person may say, hey, I was raised poor and I was suffering, but I had a pretty good relationship with my family. And we were communal. And so I can actually teach you how to do things together a little bit better. And this person over here is saying, hey, I had some more stability than you. I think things were going well. But if I'm being honest with you, I really know how to help people financially. And I know how to give and I need all that. But, but if I'm being completely honest with you, I, I don't really know how to do the community thing because my parents worked a lot. And since my parents worked a lot, I don't actually know what it means to really be a parent. And so now I've provided for my kids, but was I really there? 
But then this parent may say, I was there for my kids, but I wasn't able to provide the way I wanted to because I didn't have the financial stability and resources. Can you imagine if two people from two different worlds had a conversation that came together and says, I have what you need, you have what I need, and instead of saying we're incorrect, we're just incomplete, but if we do it together, we'll be complete. This is what Jesus is telling this Pharisee. He's saying your viewpoint is of up there and you're looking down there. But he said, there's power in unity. There's power in doing things together. And there's power because what makes us different doesn't have to separate us. And so I think it's a beautiful conversation because what you see is, and I'm guilty, we're all guilty of it based on our worldview. So I'm not preaching to you or at you, I'm preaching with you. Because how we view the world and the lens is based on how we were raised. And how we were raised wasn't incorrect. It was just incomplete. There's a reason why in Scripture they talk about culture, ethnicity, and where you're from. But there's no place in the Bible, Pastor Todd, you read the Bible a little bit longer than me, uh, but I've never... That's very true. You do everything longer than me. And so, so, so I'm still a little new to this. <laughs> and I'm tr- but I've never read anywhere in Scripture where God loves somebody else more than the other. There's seasons. I've never seen it where the Jew, the Gentile, where Jesus said, you, you're better because you're a Jew. You suck because you're a Gentile. Or vice versa. I've never seen it. I've never seen it where because I'm African American, my hair grow up and a lot of your hair grow down. That's okay. I don't think I'm better. I don't think you better. I don't think we worse. It's just different. But that's what makes us beautiful and unique and creating the image of God. And so he's talking to this Pharisee and he said, I want to invite, I want you to invite those people. I want you to invite those people to gain relationship. I want you to invite those people to build with them. I want you to invite those people, but it's going to cost you. He closes like this, and I'll read this. Because the transformative process starts with being in the proximity to that of something that you didn't know was possible. When we are limited similarity, we only see the world through the lens of what I know. And that's not a wrong picture, but it is an incomplete picture. But when I invite people that can't repay me with money, but they do bring other things to the table. And I would argue that maybe Jesus is meeting with these Pharisees and the elite of the elite to prove to them that there's more to life than your comfort group. So transformation by proximity exists because Jesus challenged them to to expose themselves to people that they look down upon they're different from. Or people that they're trying to figure out how or would we ever exist and have commonalities. And so the human answer is no, we're different. We don't belong together. I mean, let me be honest, I'm I'm planning a church in the city where I've talked to pastors and they say, yeah, Des, you need to pick what audience. You gonna go black or you gonna go white? Had that real conversation. Because church growth, when you plant a church, you got to pick a people. Because people like, I mean, this is all the church planting books. You pick a certain person and people, so you're my target. But I serve a God who's bigger than that. And I serve a God who, who I've had poor African-American pastors speaking to my life. I've had poor white pastors speaking to my life. I've had rich African-American pastors speaking to my life. I have, I have put, I'm, I've had all of it because I see what God is doing. And so what it's saying is when we only see it from our lens, we're not incorrect. We're just incomplete. And the summer finishes like this. Uh, we on slide four, Robert. And you will be blessed because you cannot, they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. A resurrection of the just, uh, this is only seen one other time, similarly, not exactly, um, in Acts 24, 15. And the difference in Acts 24, 15 is that they do a compare and contrast to the just and the unjust. Here we're just talking about the just. And I love this because so often Pharisees 
was about the right now in this moment. And Jesus is giving them a small lesson in the not yet. So you see, the right now said, I have everything going. Everything's good right here. And Jesus says, can I expand your thought to think of kingdom? Can I expand your thought to think of expansion? Can I expound your thought to say that one day you guys will all be together? And how do we exemplify and continue to do a sample of heaven on earth? And I would argue you can't do heaven on earth if we're always separated. There's a power of invitation in being able to invite someone to a space where they can feel loved, they can feel cared for, and they can feel seen. And the invitation says, I see you. It's all it does, the power of invitation. The invitation tells people, I see you, I love you, I care. And it's a representation of our Savior, Jesus Christ, or Emmanuel, God with us. And, and so I want for just a quick moment, then we're going to pray this out. Um, I want you to take out a phone, if you have a phone with you or a piece of paper. And I want you to write down a name, somebody that's on your heart. Well, maybe God's saying, I, I, you should invite them to Good Shepherd. And the first thing you're going to, your mind's going to tell you, and this is a good thing, is going to say, oh, will they fit in? Will they like it? It's, that's what we do. It's, it, it's natural. Will they fit in? Will they like it? Oh, will it be okay? Um, maybe they'll like the preacher. Maybe they won't. Uh, my congregation's cool. Maybe they won't. Uh, so, but I want you to write that name down. You come up, David. I want you to write that name down. And I want you to pray on that name, and I want you to either shoot them a text, if you see them at work, and just invite them. And just see what the Holy Spirit does. I don't want you to do nothing else. I just want you to invite them. And that's the power of invitation, to say that I go to a place and we worship a God that changed my life. And if he could do it for me, he could do it for you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this moment. God, we thank you that when we look around this room, that, God, there is diversity from gen different genders, different socioeconomic statuses, different races, different cultures, different ethnicities. But, God, you work everything out, and we're able to sit here and be who we are in you. And understanding that there's something about the blood of Jesus that got me when I was sitting in Omaha, Nebraska, had no idea I'd be sitting at Good Shepherd Church in Sacramento, California. But it's that same grace and that same love. And so, God, we come now just asking to be more like you, that you've expound our vision, that you've expound our circle, that we understand and know that what we believe and how we were raised it's not incorrect, but if we only stay siloed, it will be incomplete. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray and say it together. Amen. Amen.